<coughs> so let's talk about the next few weeks. Uh, today we're going to cover the rest of PeopleWare and the, I think it's Webster 5 reading set. This is what you start reading as of this week. We're going to do it in two weeks. Again, notice, light, breezy. You know, this isn't a text on computer architecture or operating systems design. Uh, it's very anecdotal, very fast read, uh, <coughs> and very useful source of references for the midterm. The, I updated the calendar on the web page. The midterm is the second Monday in November. Uh, so basically, we're going to cover, today we're going to cover PeopleWare and Webster 5. Next week, we'll cover the first three chapters of Facts and Fallacies and Webster 6. The week after that, we'll cover the, the last three chapters of Facts and Fallacy and do a midterm review, and then we'll do the midterm itself. Uh, midterm, again, is here, class period, open note, open book, open computer, open device, just not open person next to you. Uh, or elsewhere in the room. Uh, as I said at the very start, <coughs> typical program or the typical problem you're going to see on the midterm is to describe a hypothetical real world situation and then ask you, for example, you know, name three risks that you see in this situation and provide citations for them. And this is where you go back and go to Brooks, or go to DeMarco and Lister, or go to Glass, or go to one of my articles and pull it up uh, and provide the citation. We'll go over during, during the uh, review, I'll go back over through uh, what the, what the pr problems will look like. There'll be probably one or two problems at least that we'll talk about <coughs> deliverables. Uh, from the software development life cycle, why they're important, you know, why, why you might use them, what considerations you might have, and so on. Uh, all my lectures are out there right now. All, all the slides for all the lectures are out there right now, including today's. Uh, and I should have all the video, including today's, by later this week. So during the test, you're welcome to go out and actually pull up the slides. Uh, the uh, welcome to me, like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's <coughs> the idea here. My goal isn't memorization, it's twofold. First, it's to get these ideas in your head in the first place, and second, for you to say, I know someone said something about this, I think it's Brooks, let's see where it is. Oh, yes, it was Brooks. Uh, and here's where he said it. Uh, the and, and personally, my, my goal here is to prepare you for being out there in the real world and facing the uh, situations in your face at work and uh, know what you're getting into and, and whether or not you need to raise your hand and say, hey, I see a problem here and, and here are some authorities I can cite it or, or whether you need to start putting your resume out on the market. Yes? So for citing things on the tests, what about like the podcasts? Cause those uh, if you okay. cite the podcast, cite the podcast. Just okay. say it's you know it's this specific podcast. Give the title. Uh, it's brought up in here, and that's that's good enough. Okay. Yeah, you don't you don't need to know <laughs> the exact time in the podcast. Uh, uh, so, on the other hand, if you cite a podcast, and I go back and I'm having a hard time finding where the podcast is or where it's in the podcast. It's like okay. And, and again, as, and we'll talk about this, <clears throat> when you're signing one of the authors, I want something more than just chapter two. It's like chapter two, and at the very least, a subsection within the chapter. You can cite, some of you are going to have electronic copies of these books, so it's going to be hard to cite pages, per se, and make it consistent. But at the very least, a subheading in the book, or preferably a brief quote from it. There's sort of a fine balance here between forcing you to retype text and uh, making sure you're not just sort of waving your hands. Yeah, I hope it's in there somewhere. Uh, and if it's not, you know, if, if the less the less precise your citation is, if I have any questions as to whether or not that source applies, the less points you're going to get. <laughs> so, the more convinced I am that you actually 
know what you're talking about and you're pointing at the right place. It's like, okay, yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, last semester, I think I had five or six questions on the midterm, plus one extra credit. I may go with a few more questions and a few fewer points per question uh, to mix it up a bit more. Uh, I'll have to think about that. I will try to make sure I have the, the midterm completely done before we do the midterm week the week before. So I'll say, okay, this is, here's exactly what you expect when you come and sit. It's electronic, it's going to be through Learning Suite. So make sure you have a device that, that you can get onto the learning suite with uh, to come take the test. Uh, and then once we're done with the midterm, things ease up a bit. Of course, we're only about three or four weeks away from the end of the semester. Uh, I may have my daughter Crystal, the one I keep talking about, come in and talk. Uh, just because she can give you all the... She's been out there now for two and a half years, and she's like, okay, let me tell you what, <laughs> what rude awakenings I've had since graduating two and a half years ago. Uh, well, we'll cover a few more topics. Oh, and, and I've, I've said this already <clears throat> and put it in the notes. The Webster 7 reading goes to a site on one of my, or goes to a page on one of my websites. <coughs> that has a whole set of pitfalls of modern software engineering. Uh, we're not going to, you're not required to read those, we're not going to cover them until after the midterm, but I would actually recommend that you go and look through those because I think you'll find a number of them will provide good shortcuts, uh, particularly because of the way they're written. Uh, in fact, I'll, let me bring it up real quick here. what it's going to look like. Uh, where do I have that? I think that's here. Yeah. That's what the page looks like. So it's a lot of reading, so it's spread out over a couple of weeks, uh, and it's after the midterm. But if you look, oh, sorry. Probably can't read most of these. Uh, pitfalls are things like using the wrong developers, using the wrong metrics, lying to yourself and others not identifying and managing risks, adopting a technology or methodology without well-defined objectives, misjudging relative costs, allowing new features to creep or pour in, allowing the specification of drift or change for that agreement, attempting too much, too fast, too soon, <laughs> which I think you're all dealing with right now, uh, abandoning good software engineering practices, so on and so forth. So <clears throat> that's, a, that's a, actually a nice page to have in your back pocket uh, for the midterm because There'll probably be at least a few questions where instead of having to dig through Brooks or uh, Robert Glass or whatever, you can look and say, oh, hey, look, that applies. Let's cite that. And I will, I will accept, even though that will not have been covered, I will accept any citations of those pitfalls. Yeah? Will those pitfalls, um, like those specific articles in there, sometimes reference Brooks? You know what I mean? Some, like, uh, some of them I will. That some of your articles have. Yeah, some, some, some of them will have references to, to, to Brooks. Uh, or to Marco and Lister, or I don't know if I have any that reference uh, Robert Glass or not. Uh, these are actually, I, 20 years ago I wrote a book called Pitfalls of Objectory Development. And basically what I found is that a lot of the pitfalls I identified back then are generic to software development, period. And so these are <coughs> slightly revised and more generalized pitfalls, uh, but they match for what I had in the book. So, any questions on any of that? <coughs> Make a, oh, yes. Where did we find that with you? Uh, that's, that's actually, if you go to CS428 readings, the online that's readings for all the web, that's Webster 7. If you just follow the click under Webster 7, that's it. Uh, and like I said, you're not, you don't have to, you're, you're not required to read that until after the midterm, but it's useful for the midterm, so I just want to make sure you're aware of it. Uh, it's worth spending a few minutes to go through and look at, and then when you go to the midterm, it's good to have it bookmarked or whatever, just go to it. I'm going to switch here to save myself some editing. Hang on a second. Okay, so let's finish up PeopleWare. I lumped the last three sections together because, frankly, 
after part four, parts five and six, it gets pretty sparse. The chapters are like two or three pages, and there's like one idea in the chapter. Uh, and I didn't want to drag this out, and I, again, I really wanted to get through Robert Glass before the midterm. Growing product, and, and this part is, is possibly one of the most important sections in all of people learn. Because as hard as it is, as I said, as, as hard as finding the best people, getting good people to work together as a team is hard too. I mean, that, was, that's, that almost blew up in my face at pages. And without, without uh, the help of some of the team members and a few changes in our approach, it, it would have failed, despite the fact that these were all great developers, they were all smart, they were actually all decent, mature human beings, so on and so forth. But boy, when you get a lot of bright people together on a team, there could be some real clashes of egos. Uh, so, and, and this is, in some respects, this is even harder from a management point of view. I mean, it's, it's enough of a challenge to screen for and hire good people. As DeMarco and Lister point out, it's easier to talk about how to kill a good team than how to form one. Okay. <clears throat> so, the first couple chapters really talk about the idea of a gelled team, meaning one that's, that's where everyone's working together, they're handing stuff off, they're knowing how to get along, so on. Uh, and this gets back to something we've talked about a lot, which is that part of the key here is a conscious, explicit alignment of personal and team goals. Uh, finding out what the individual goals are of the team members, and then crafting team goals that meet the individual goals. Part of the challenge there is that the personal and team goals may or may not necessarily line up with company goals. So there's, a bit of, there's often a bit of subversion here. It's kind of like, okay, we're doing this because we're a team and we want to do this, and we know that if we're management, it's nuts what they're asking for, so we're going to try and do the right thing and support them. Uh, that's, that's actually a fairly classic syndrome in a lot of established organizations. Startups usually start up because it's like we're tired of dealing with upper management, we're just going to start a new company. But you have a whole different set of issues with startups, which we'll talk about later in the uh, year. What are the aspects of a gel team? What, what, what signifies it? Low turnover, strong sense of identity as a team, a sense of eliteness, like, you know, hey, we're great guys. This is wonderful. We're, we're working hard here. Joint ownership of the product. Everyone is invested in what you're doing. And obvious enjoyment of the work. Creating this is hard. That's part of what we're going to talk about next. Is how to kill a team. <laughs> and... <clears throat> We're really down to this thing. Most organizations don't set out consciously to kill. That should be don't, not doesn't. Don't set out consciously to kill teams. They just act that way. Uh, so some of the things. Didn't we have this problem last week? <laughs> Vacuum started up. I think they're leaf blowers. It's even worse. Oh. The uh, defensive management where you have distrust and, and micromanagement. I've mentioned before working at uh, Singer Link, which was sort of my dream job. I was at NASA. I was working on space shuttle flight simulators. I was talking with astronauts. And it was like armed camp between management and engineering. They distrusted us. They were, they were openly hostile towards us as <coughs> engineers. Uh, I left after six months. Uh, a lot of paperwork and busy work. It's like, we want you to document everything. Uh, I, I think back at Erink on the Motorola Iridium project, they had this extremely detailed methodology. I think I may have mentioned this before, so pardon repetition. But repetition is how I remember. Very detailed methodology where you had to you know, decide what you're going to build. You had to build it, then you had to submit certain forms to get it approved. And then you had to test it, and then you could check it in. Well, they held on to this methodology, but at the same time, they thought, okay, we need to be flexible, we need to be working fast, so we're going to do weekly check-ins. 
Well, one of the things I pointed out to management, being a consultant who could utter truths without worrying about being fired, uh, I said, you realize that you're leaving the developers one day a week to program. The requirements and the methodology, all the things, all the hoops you make them jump through in terms of what they have to do, approval, paperwork, everything else, they basically program on Tuesday. It takes them to Monday to get everything set up so that they're allowed to program. They program on Tuesday. It takes Wednesday and Thursday to check stuff in and do all the testing, and then Friday is theoretically the new build. I said, you're either going to have to extremely streamline this methodology or you're going to have to stop doing weekly builds because you can't, you can't make progress on a program programming one day a week. You really can't. Physical separation. This remains a area of dispute in the software industry. We like, in theory, the idea of, hey, you know, we're, we're all tech people. We can be distributed in different places. And we'll do everything. You know, we'll communicate online. And we'll have our, you know, GitHub repository and so on and so forth. But I have actually managed distributed development teams. And there is a tremendous amount that is lost when you don't have some degree of physical co-location. Uh, at Pages, we had one of our developers who moved back to Florida for two years because her husband was exo at Pensacola Naval Air Station. And we continued, we kept her on the payroll, and she continued to do work, and she'd fly out to San Diego about once a month, once every other month. But when she find, when they finally, the two of them transferred back to San Diego, she says, I feel like I've been in exile for two years. I feel like I've missed so much of what the project has been doing because I haven't been around for any of these discussions. Fragmentations of people's time. Okay, this gets back to the flow issue. You know, it's, it's the issue where, okay, we actually want you to work. You're really great. You're a great program. We're going to have you work on three different projects. Uh, and you've got three different managers you're dealing with, and you've got three different specifications, but you know, you're bright, we know you can do this. Uh, <clears throat> you never really gel as a team because you're, you're, it's kind of like you're doing context switching on a regular basis. Does yeah, that happen very much? Uh, in some organizations, yes. Actually, my, my first job was at General Dynamics was a bit like this, except that I was never on the team. It was all individual work. Uh, at General Dynamics uh, in San Diego, they had 10,000 engineers, and then they had this software engineering group of about 100 people. And we were basically day laborers for hire. Engineers would come and say, I need a programmer 20 hours a week, work on this project. And Tom Reed, my boss, would look around and say, OK, Webster, you're working with him. So I would often have two or three projects going on at the same time. And a different engineer I was working with, but I was never that was just me. I wasn't doing this with other engineers. I was doing, doing something specific. The few team projects I worked on, one of which was a cruise missile simulation, I was part of a team, and that was all I did for my duration on that project. And it was very, very clean scope. It's like, OK, Webster, we need you to implement these particular graphics displays for the simulation. Uh, and I spent a couple months doing that, got it done, checked it in, and moved on to something else. Quality reduction of the product. Nothing will discourage individuals and teams more than saying, oh, we're going to deliberately ship a crappy product in order to make this deadline. Uh, people, generally speaking, people like to take pride in the work they're doing. And if you're deliberately undermining the quality of what they're producing, it's kind of like, this is embarrassing. I don't want to be. I don't want to be working on this. I'm going to go find something that I can do right. Phony deadlines. Oh my gosh. This is, we've talked about this any number of times. It's, it's the classic. We have to ship this game in October for the Christmas market. We don't care how many bugs there are in it. Uh, so there you have the quality issue and, and the phony deadline. It's like, you know, the company will go under if we don't ship by this date. And it's like, really? You really think company's going to go under if we don't ship by this date? If it is, then I'm going to start putting out my resume, because we're not going to ship by the state. <laughs> uh, click control. 
Now, I've never run into this, but DeMarco and Lister bring this up a couple times that they're, particularly in classic organizations like this team is getting uh, too full of themselves, we're going to break them up and spread them around because they're hard to control. I personally have never encountered that. Uh, but then, by and large, I haven't really worked in corporate IT as, a, as an employee. Uh, phony motivation. This is the, the story I told where with Pages while we we're running late. Had the CEO and CFO, who again, I have great respect for both of them, but they're trying to think, how can we motivate these programmers? I mean, my gosh, we've been working 70 hours a week for three years. It's, it's not like we were sitting around on our hands. Uh, and it's kind of like, well, you know, they, they, we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll cut wages if we haven't shipped by Christmas, or you know, we'll, we'll do this bonus, we'll give everyone you know vacation and so on. And and that's where I said my my sister, who was one of the software engineers, stopped me in the hallway and said, "Don't they know they're dealing with grown-ups? Uh, you know, we we're, we're all working as hard as we can. We don't need carrots and sticks." We just need time to actually get the product done. Extended overtime. Uh, again, a very big issue. And I, I really lean towards uh, DeMarco and Lister that the number of productive programming hours you can get out of a software engineer, for short, for short times you can be productive with extended overtime. Uh, beyond that, you're still only getting a certain number of productive hours and the rest tends to get filled up with email and phone calls and meetings and all that sort of stuff. Pitting team members against each other. Again, I have been fortunate that I, I can't recall ever having run into this directly. Uh, I've certainly seen situations where it could happen. Now, this wasn't in a software environment, but I, I spent uh, two years at PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was a director there. Uh, and they have a pyramid model, and they have what's called up or out. So as directors, we were responsible, and so there's a group of us who are directors in the IT group within the dispute analysis and investigation group, basically expert witness group. And we had a number of, what was the next level now, managers? A number of managers. We had to stack rank them. Who knows what stack ranking? Stack ranking says we have 10 managers and we're going to rate them 1 through 10. There are no ties. The top two are A's, the next threes are B's, the next five are C's, and the, the remaining few are D's. And anyone who is in an A or B should leave the company. That is actually a way of life in a lot of consulting organizations. It's called upper out. If you don't get yourself stack ranked uh, to that A or B level, you might as well go find another job. And it doesn't matter whether the gap there is, you know, 10% or a tenth of a percent. And that's often fairly, having been through the process, it's often fairly arbitrary. Arbitrary. It often involves a lot of. Uh, if I have a manager, as a director, I have a manager that I think is really great. I've got to sit and argue with all the other directors about why my manager should be in that top five uh, as opposed to their favorite managers. Anyway. I've also heard that there are companies that will um, kind of pit some of their low-level interns and um, just new hires against each other such that after six months the, the best performers will, they will keep. But if you don't perform better than everyone else that they hired, then you don't move on with the company. You don't stay with them. I, 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 again, I haven't personally experienced that, but I'm not surprised at all. There, there, there's a fair amount of this out in corporate America. Uh, it's just that outside of general dynamic, well, outside of a few places, I, I haven't been that much in corporate America per se. Now. What do you do to help teams gel? Provide frequent, easy opportunities for the team to succeed together. Uh, Steve Jobs used to like to say, real artistship. 
Uh, and so if you're trying to gel a team, you know, give them a project, a small project that they can succeed with and succeed well, and they will have that sense of camaraderie. It's like, hey, yeah, we got this done. As long as everyone's pulling their weight. Uh, <laughs> it may be awful in this current setting to, to crack this joke, but there's, there's a standard meme that goes around on Twitter a lot that basically says, when I die, I want the people from my college group project to be the ones to help lower me into the grave so they can let me down one more time. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I know Crystal, during her time at the U, had, had, had some group projects that went well and had some group projects that did not go well at all. I trust all your group projects are going well. Okay, show trust in the team by not protecting yourself from their mistakes. Now, this is from the manager's point of view. If you're trying to manage a team and get it to gel, give them a chance to screw up in a way that will hurt you. Instead of stepping in and saying, no, I can't let you do that. No, I can't let you do that. And develop the responsibility down in their sense to say, my gosh, if we, if we fail on this, Webster's in trouble. We can't let that happen. You know, let's pull together, let's, let's resolve our differences, let's get things working. The structure has given us the rope, and you know, he's the one who's going to take it if, if we fail here, so let's not let that happen. Get out of their hair or send them away for a while. Don't micromanage. Uh, <clears throat> there's, there is a risk of being too hands-off. Uh, you can have problems where individual developers will hide out and you won't know what they're doing uh, and then you find out six weeks later they haven't been doing anything. Uh, so you, you do need to know what progress is being made and hopefully the team has been set up that it's monitoring it. But on the other hand, uh, don't bug them every day. Give them a chance to get work done. Encourage productive rule breaking. You know, it's kind of like, hey, we want to bring in a new technology, and you know, we're we're committing to you, boss, that we we can do this and get this done. It's like, fine, okay. This 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 tends to be tied into by not protecting yourself from the team. Let them do things that the company might not approve of, but will help them gel as a team and help them succeed. Allow teams to self-organize. Now, I I haven't been in a place where this has happened. But uh, DeMarco and Lister cite some places where instead of saying we're building a team for a project, they basically say, okay guys, divide yourselves up into teams. Figure out who you want to work with. And once you're in teams, we'll figure out what project each team is going to do. And trust the natural authority of individual team members. Uh, this is a challenge in particular for those of you who may end up at some point becoming more managerial and hands-on technical, uh, you have to at some point say, I trust that the developers know more, or at least since they're having a living with, have more invested in the technical decisions they're making. So I'm going to let them do it. Oops. Chemistry for team formation, it's a lot of the same stuff. It's, it's, it's sort of the opposite of the team aside. Demand high quality, provide lots of satisfying closure. Again, ship product, complete projects, build a sense of completeness, protect successful teams. You'll often have companies that will break up a team after a project even though the team has gelled well. Instead of saying, we've got another tough project, let's just give it, just give it to the same team. Don't micromanage, provide strategic but not technical. And encourage the team to mix things up as far as uh, <laughs> just as far as the composition. I, I always think back, I was on the math team for one year in high school. And of course, this is we're talking now almost 50 years ago. But even back then, I found it funny that our math team, it was five people on the team. We were all male, white, left-handed, and myopic. 
it's like if you if you got five nerds from Central Casting and just lined them up, it's like yeah, that's us. <laughs> okay. Fertile soil. These uh, these chapters and these sections really, like I said, the content here is sort of. Uh, Get, tends to get a bit, a bit more sparse. Chapter 29 is more on what to do to improve overall quality with performance in the organization. Uh, any necessary training, the proper tools, peer review. Dancing with Risk, and, and DeMarc and Lister, by the way, have a great book called uh, Waltzing with Bears, which is specifically about risk management in IT. Uh, as with armor, the problem you have is that greater reward requires greater risk. In other words, if you're simply doing the exact same thing that's been done before, the risk is very low, but you've already done it before, you've done something very similar, where's the payoff? So sort of the more you, you push off from shore into unknown waters, the greater the risk is, but if you succeed, the greater the possible reward. And this is, this is a key point, and this is, my gosh, I see this so much. Even in organizations that are good at managing risk, they will not explicitly talk about and plan for the risk of project failure. There's always the assumption the project is going to succeed, even though the rate of failure of large IT projects is, is pretty steep. So it's good at the start, particularly for larger projects or for startups, to say, what happens if we fail? What will that look like? And what will we do? And, and part of the key issue there is that the failure to plan for failure leads to projects that go way over schedule, way over budget, and then they pull the plug when they should have pulled the plug much, much sooner. One of the things uh, in, in failed projects that I've reviewed as an expert witness, I'm almost always praised when I've seen the customer pull the plug early. And part of my testimony is that was exactly the right thing to do because the pattern here is if you don't pull the plug then, you go on another six to 12 months and then you pull the plug and you've already spent X more millions of dollars and you've lost a year of time or whatever. Management, the, chapter 31 and 32 are basically about management, don't waste your people's time with unnecessary meetings. Meeting isn't to, to make a decision on a specific topic, then why are you holding it? Uh, and again, flooding people with email wastes their time too. Now this is one of my favorite quotes of all time because this is also a key reason for project failure. It's Machiavelli, the prince. Nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead of an introduction of a new order of things. New project, replacement system, whatever. Because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions, and lukewarm defenders and those who may do well under the new. And actually Machiavelli goes on to explain, uh, because people don't believe that the new system will be better until they actually have a chance to experience it. That's why you often have lukewarm defenders. So you've got improvement requires change, but it's actually quite common change for that improvement. If you don't do the project right, you basically get the worst of both worlds. You get change but no improvement. Organizational learning, I like this phrase. Organizational learning is limited by an organization's ability to keep its best people. If you want to improve as an organization, you have to keep your best people. And our concept of making a community is sort of the gel team concept, but gelling is an entire organization, not just as a team. Uh, it's supposed to be fun to work here. I actually have some objections to that because I, I'm... From 40 years, sometimes work is work. You collect a paycheck. <laughs> uh, it's not always fun to work here. Uh, as I have counseled my children and my children-in-law uh, on numerous occasions, 
if you're going to quit a job, make sure you have a new one first. Uh, I've, I've had a couple who have not done that and who have, have suffered financially with you know, a spouse and children at home as a result. It's like, oh yeah, I told them off and they fired me. And it's like, what do you do now? You know, you're unemployed, you were fired from your last job. That's not a good thing in the job market. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, that said, this again is for a management point of view. These are the sorts of things which are great and it's so hard to get any upper management approval for. Uh, if you're going to do a new technology, a new language, new engine, do it on a pilot project. Don't do it on a mission critical project. You know, do it on something you can afford to fail or that you can experiment around with. Not on something that's going to affect the bottom line of the company six months from now. But I see that happen all the time. I mean, that was, that was the, again, the story that I told from, uh, from Eric with the second project there. It's kind of like, oh yeah, we've got this new programming language we've never used and the development environment is a 1.0 release of a development environment. And it's an impossible schedule, we don't have an architecture, we're going to get this done in two months. And, you know, my brain just, it's like, are you nuts? <laughs> You're absolutely nuts. This is going to fail in so many different ways, and it did. It failed utterly. Uh, give your best people room to do things, and their whole dance chapter is sort of like, yeah, 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 change your organization. Anyway, so that finishes off people where, oh, yes? It's kind of confusing, like, the whole, so weren't you just saying in the previous slides, like, you don't want people within an organization like competing against each other or like... Oh, you mean like with the war game stuff? Yeah, it's so? kind of confusing. Oh, that well, that's, that's a fun thing. That's a... Okay. That, that's, not, that's not a, a not like you know, survivor and you get voted off the island. Right. That's like, okay, we're going to divide up into two teams. Here's a project. I want you as two separate teams to see it and we're going to see who can get this done quicker and what are the lessons learned. <coughs> uh, it's, it, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not like, okay, and we're going to fire the people who come in second. <laughs> No, I don't want, to, don't want to do that. You're exactly right there. Let's go ahead and break until... I only have one more lecture here, so let's break until 10 after uh, or so, or whenever we get everyone together. I'll take roll. We'll go over the Webster readings, which should be pretty quick. And then uh, you'll have the rest of the time for team meetings. <laughs>